So welcome to our Friday webinar series. We have started, as you know, this series about three years back, where we wanted to bring the world's best minds on contemporary issues. So when we started the series almost close to the COVID pandemic, we had thought that the whole globe is facing serious challenges, economics, partly sociological, with an implication on economics, and partly geopolitical, also with an implication on economics. So as EGRU is a policy-oriented research-based think tank, these were important to us. We have been very fortunate. We have had, I think, one of the most fantastic blend of Indian scholars and Western scholars from across the world talking to us. We have also been very fortunate that we have had two Nobel laureates come and speak to us. And as I feel, a few of the speakers who came here are potential Nobel laureates. One of them I can share with you is Philip Aguirre, uh, a great economist on growth. I, I just keep waiting. When will he be awarded the Nobel Prize? And so a few others. We have been discussing basically policy issues and those issues on which India or the world is facing a challenge. It is in that very context that today's presentation has been invited uh, from this excellent research piece, which of course, Professor Deodar uh, will introduce you as well as the author who is speaking to us. To chair the session today, we have invited Professor Satish Devdar from Indian Institute of Management to chair the session and share his own research as well as guide us through this presentation. Professor Devdar has been at Indian Institute of Management Ahmedabad, one of the most premier academic institutions in our country. He has worked on series of projects, mainly research. He has worked with the World Trade Organization. He has also conducted research projects for India's Ministry of Food Processing, Ministry of Agriculture, Economic Research Service of the US Department of Agriculture. He was selected as the Hewlett Fellow of the International Agriculture Trade Research Consortium during 2006 and 8. Professor Deodar was the recipient of the Outstanding PhD Dissertation Award from the U.S. Food Distribution Research Society and has been honored with the Divang Mehta Best Professor of Economics Award in 2012 and 2015. I think, Professor, we met there yes, for the yes. first time together. <laughs> Yes, I come from I am I had come from I am Bangalore, and That's you had come from I am Ahmedabad. That's very good. interesting meeting there yes. in Bombay. We have also been the uh, recipient of the distinguished Young Professor Award for Excellence in Research from IIMA. He has a reputation of a very good professor in research and teaching both at IIMA. He has held various positions, including admission chair, PGP chair, placement chair. He is a life member of the Association of Food Scientists and Technologists and serves on the advisory board of Carita Agricom Limited. He was on the board of Asian Granito Limited as an independent director. He has been also, and this is something very special, Rarely would a professor of economics achieve this. He was also instrumental in bringing out the commemorative postal stamp by India's Department of Post in the memory of the 18th century Indian statesman Bajirao Peshwa I. He has authored a number of books, and one of his books, Day to Day Economics, I would say is a national bestseller in non fiction category with more than 60,000 copies sold till date. Professor Deodar was the pioneer convener of the largest annual computerized common admission test, CAT, conducted by IIMS 
for admission to management schools. It's an amazing test CAT and many believe it is much better than GMAT. One thing which I must mention about Professor Deodar and I have been thinking and working together on a very, very important subject. Professor Fabrizio, you would be interested in knowing what we both are trying to work on. Professor Deodar and me are trying to see what were the economic theories that were sustainable on 5,000 year basis and not just a century or two. So we are peeping into ancient India and trying to figure out what were the pillars of economic philosophy and theory on which India was the richest country on the planet for straight 3,000 years. So both of us and a few other colleagues of ours are trying to bring to the world the wisdom of ancient India by virtue of which we progressed so well and we did not bring the world to the brink of a climate crisis. How did we achieve that? That is something which is very dear to Professor Deodar and we are also working on it and I hope one day we'll have a theory, uh, a very cogent theory to share with the rest of the world in near future. With this, I hand over the session to Professor Deodar to conduct the proceedings further. Professor. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Professor Sharan Singh. Really kind introduction. For a minute, I thought, am I going to be the speaker? <laughs> Thank you. But no. <laughs> So I'm glad to be here. Thanks for giving me this uh, opportunity. Uh, let me introduce uh, to you all uh, today's speaker. Um, Professor Fabrizio Zilibotti uh, is the Tentex Professor of International and Development Economics at uh, Yale University. Uh, he's a fellow of the Econometric Society and a past recipient of the Yerjo Johnson, I hope I get that word right, um, medal which is given to the best economist under 45 uh, in Europe. Uh, he is a former editor of Econometrica, the Review of Economic Studies, and the Journal of the European Economic Association. Uh, he was the president of the European Economic Association in 2016. His research interests uh, include economic growth, development, technical change, inequality, and family economics. He has published articles in all leading economics journals. Uh, he's a co-author of the book, and you'll like this, Love, Money, and Parenting with uh, Dobke. Is that the right pronunciation, Dobke? Yeah. Uh, published by Princeton University Press in 2019 and translated in several foreign languages. He has published several articles on the economic growth of emerging economies, especially China. He received the Sun Ye Fang Prize, which is given to the most prestigious economics award in China uh, for his article, Growing Like China, with Song and Stores Latin. This was published in American Economic Review in 2011. He has also published articles on the economic development of India, uh, most notably, the unequal effects of liberalization Evidence from Dismantling the License Raj in India. This is with uh, Agion, Burgess, and Redding. Uh, published again in American Economic Review in 2008. And the latest is a Growing Like India, The Unequal Effects of Service-Led Growth. And this is with Fan and Peters. Uh, it's in press right now at uh, Econometrica. So, uh, Professor uh, Zilipati is going to talk to you on this last subject, Growing Like India. Uh, um, so, uh, uh, Professor Zilipati, the floor is uh, yours. I would think uh, you can take about 45 minutes to uh, make your case. Thereafter, uh, we'll have question answer session for, let's say, about 15 minutes or so, and then we will close. And I'll hand it over to Professor Charan Singh. So floor is yours, Professor Zilibati. Thank you very much. Let me first 
see if it works. Can you confirm that you can see my slides, please? Yes, yes, we can. Yes. So, first of all, uh, Professor Singh, Professor Deodar, thanks so much for this invitation and uh, to all of you attendees. Uh, I'm, I'm very thrilled of uh, speaking to an Indian audience about this project. Uh, because, of course, uh, you know, I've as much uh, uh, to learn, so much to learn from, from your comments. So, uh, so this is a paper of a team of researchers at uh, uh, Yale University uh, that looks at the process of structural transformation of the Indian economy. Uh, so we're motivated from the observation that, uh, well, India is uh, uh, one of the fastest growing nations uh, in the world that's recently actually uh, surpassed uh, uh, China in terms of the annual growth rate. Uh, it is also a country uh, that is uh, undergoing a profound transformation of its uh, economic structure. So the data we consider here, uh, you know, the span of time we mostly focus is 1987-2011, where we have, uh, uh, we think, good data, uh, thanks to the, of course, to the production of data that uh, your country has, which is exceptional. And, uh, uh, you know, the, agricult the agricultural, uh, the decline of cultural employment uh, and of share GDP of agriculture was remarkable during this period, uh, about uh, um, 17 percentage points. And the observation that uh, has caught uh, uh, many people, many economists' attention, is that most of this uh, has been a transition out of agriculture into employment in service industries and uh, also in construction industry. And very little has gone to uh, manufacturing. Now, this is somehow uh, a perception that people have of India. Uh, it's not uh, uh, as well known that India is by no means exceptional among uh, developing countries today. So this is a, a picture that is a, one of the few cross-country pictures I, I'm showing you that uh, shows uh, the, the, the change in agricultural employment share during this period you see uh, plotted uh, on the left against the change in service employment share and in, on the right change in manufacturing employment share. So uh, these are all countries with uh, a GDP per capita in 2019 lower than China, just to focus on uh, what I can call broadly speaking uh, the developing world. And you can see that most of the change that we observe is actually transition from agriculture to services. For every percent, 10 percentage point declining agricultural employment, on average, manufacturing employment only increases by two percentage points, while service sector employment grows by seven percentage points. And India is by no means uh, an exception. It's almost on the regression line. So this is a feature of the developing world today, uh, not only of India. That explains why, in the end, we changed the title to growing like India to emphasize that this is a pattern that uh, involves many countries. Now, if we look at the history of uh, today's industrialized country and, and also of China, uh, this is the way the uh, industrialization process looks like. So we, uh, we observe this kind of hump shape where the share of the labor force employed in, in, the, in the industrial sector and also the, the GDP share uh, first increases, and then uh, around 35,000 uh, or so, depending, of course, also on the year uh, in which you consider in terms of currency, but you see the, you see the picture there. And then it starts declining, and then, and then mature economies become very, very much uh, like service economies. The anomaly uh, or the particular feature of uh, uh, the developing countries today, specifically of India, is that it looks like that upward uh, part of this uh, uh, of this figure is not going as fast as it was in the past. So we're like staying somehow uh, below. Uh, another interesting observation, if we look at this uh, period, is the remarkably large role that uh, service industries that uh, uh, serve consumers uh, as opposed to uh, production sector uh, has had. So, you know, service industries is a very heterogeneous set of activities, and some of these are actually input to the production of goods. You can think that, you know, a corporate lawyer, uh, part of the ICT service sector, business services actually are input to the production 
uh, process, but other services are more like uh, complementing goods in, the, in, in, in producing final goods. And if you think about uh, sectors like retail, leisure, uh, health, uh, that are you know, also very different uh, uh, one from another in, in many respects, well, uh, we have this, uh, this, uh, this, this, this picture that uh, uh, we have had, you know, they are so important in a country like India. So in spite of the fact that, uh, especially when I talk to economists, they think of India as a development of ICT and business services, which are, of course, very important. There's still a very large part of the employment sharing services that come from, let's say, more traditional or more consumer-oriented services. Uh, this is a bit of the same picture, but uh, uh, a bit more breakdown by organization. And I just want to uh, draw your attention on the fact that it's uh, so the, the, the yellow bar is what we call consumer services. I, I won't be, uh, I, I think I have anticipated what you mean by the distinction, but I won't go into the details about how we exactly measure unless I must. And you see that there we have a profound transformation in this period. In, in the more urban districts, uh, the agriculture has become uh, uh, by far uh, you know, less important, and uh, these have become like very, very service oriented. Uh, district where 50 percent or more of the, of the labor force work in, in the service industry now of course why does this all matter in the end uh, whether we produce one thing or another uh, uh, is this so important well i guess the, the reason is first of all you know this is very different from the trajectory of of china as i already hinted to and of other successful uh, east asian economy where the manufacturing sector has played such a pronounced uh, and important role in, uh, uh, in the economy, uh, in the process of development, uh, to the point that there is actually a classical view that says, well, services are not a source of development. They are like a consequence of the process of economic development, because as we grow richer, uh, we have more resources to demand these services that are sort of some luxury goods. Actually, this is an, an economic, uh, this is a tradition thought that goes back at least to Karl Marx, which uh, who didn't have a particularly uh, positive view about uh, about services, except those that uh, are used as uh, you know in the process of production of uh, material goods. So uh, that was a traditional view, and it is echoed by comments, for instance, by great economists like Danny Roderick, who says, "Well, India uh, and other developing countries are, are going through some type of premature deindustrialization. This may be too much because in, in manufacturing is really growing at a slow rate." But that's that's the idea, and you know another view of the world, which you know some some research, mostly so far based on, on developed uh, countries, have uh, pursued, is that actually there is a lot of productivity growth in services, contrary to what uh, again this traditional view uh, holds uh, as, a, as an assumption. Now, the, one of the problem in, in sorting out this is that it's very hard to measure productivity and productivity growth in services. The main reason being that uh, quality of services is very hard to observe. So when we see the price of some services going up, is it because there is more, uh, you know, there, there's more value there? or it's because uh, there are more costs in producing that and we are in some sort of uh, bone disease argument by which uh, you know, all the technical progress originates somewhere else and then this causes the wages to go up in, 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 uh, in the service sector. So what we do here is to provide a new framework that allows us to uh, uh, estimate at a granular level productivity growth in services and we do it in India but the methodology can be used in other countries. In fact, we're currently working on, on a, uh, working probably the same on China, and you know, circumventing the type of difficulties that I mentioned. And also, once we have done that, we want to uh, assess the effect of productivity growth in uh, services on structural change and welfare across the different segments of the population. So somehow, we want to create a bit of a bridge between the traditional economic growth that like, just looks at aggregate. Uh, and uh, development economics that looks more at the distribution. So we want to study uh, to what extent this type of growth favor different segments of the population. Let me give you a preview of my, the main results in case we don't get to the, uh, to the end. Uh, we document an important role of productivity growth in services during this period. Uh, you know, 
relative to our prior, I would say, surprisingly large. And within this, an important role, maybe even more surprising, of non-tradable consumer services, somehow the more traditional part, perhaps, of this. We also document important spatial differences. There are large productivity differences between urban and rural India, with the urban uh, productivity in services being higher. Perhaps that's not too surprising. But there are also very large growth uh, differences. So in uh, Indian uh, districts that have a high uh, urban share tend to be characterized by high productivity growth in services. That generates something that uh, has been uh, uh, relatively at past more unperceived, very skewed welfare gains. So those who mostly benefit uh, from this uh, uh, service that growth are first people living in, uh, in urban areas because many of these services are local in nature and second, relatively rich people because rich people tend to consume uh, stuff that is more intense in terms of value added in services and less intensive in goods, something that we find that other studies confirm. Now, although we do that in a, in a very uh, stylized environment, then uh, there's a bunch of uh, exercises where we test the robot systems of the result, we look at labor mobility, we look, at, we look, we look at the export of uh, ICT services and uh, other services uh, that became important over, over this period. And, you know, in the end, we, we conclude that these results are actually quite robust. So I'd like to spend some time first in discussing the theoretical framework. Uh, think of an economy where we have a, a, a large number of regions that will be in the empirical application of the Indian districts and where uh, value added comes from three grand sectors. Uh, the agricultural sector that produces uh, food of different type, industrial sector that produces goods, and I want you to think of the industrial sector to also, uh, you know, also part of the service sector is there, because, uh, you know, whatever is input to the production of goods that comes from the service industry, as I said, corporate lawyers, for instance, well, we consider part of that, of that sector in terms of value added. And then we have uh, some services that are provided locally that are non-tradable in nature. So, you know, the services in the restaurant, uh, the health sector, uh, leisure industry, etc. So, you know, just this, this uh, diagram, uh, imagine that, uh, uh, you know, this, there are three regions and then each region produces some input of food that may be differentiated by regions so, uh, or not, but that food in the end is tradable or subject to some trade friction. The same is for goods. Only the, uh, the uh, consumer services are non-tradable in nature and they, can, they have to be provided in the region where the final consumption takes place. So let me for a moment think uh, of a situation in which you have uh, uh, only one final good in each uh, region. Then I'll generalize uh, right away the next slides. So think about uh, the following, there is a production of some non-tradable good for local consumer that has a content of food, a content of goods, and the, 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 one, the term in brackets here is the productivity of the service workers that provide this local and uh, their number. H is their number and this uh, script A is their productivity. And then there are some uh, coefficients that, that are technological and described are, you know, some type of simplified input-output matrix. Now, in this world, the equilibrium price of this uh, uh, locally provided goods, that again is, is a composition of uh, uh, food, uh, uh, manufacturing goods and, and local services, well, it's a combination of the service of the price of the tradable goods, something that you know, we, we can hope to have good measurement of, but also of the uh, uh, local wages and the local productivity of the uh, uh, service sector. Their measurement is more of an issue. So it's really hard to have uh, some good way of measuring the local prices of uh, 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 local productivity and local prices of services that are used as input, again, the problem being the distinction between quality and uh, cost. So we have a bunch of problems where we try to get uh, some measurement here. The first is we may not have uh, so much in terms of local prices. It might be more or less easy to get all this input, determine the input out of matrix, especially if they are at the local level. And 
we, we have to go around this problem of the quality differences. In fact, uh, the model is a bit more general than that. We think that you know, in each uh, region, we have a variety of these local fine goods. Uh, think of them as being, for instance, a restaurant meal, uh, a cell phone, or a price on, on the market. So these different uh, final goods have content. So think of the restaurant meal. There are some ingredients that comes from the agriculture. There are some uh, uh, goods that comes from the kitchen equipment. And then there's some productivity and some service workers that uh, uh, relate to the provision of the service. So this is a relatively service intensive good. If we think of a cell phone, well, food is perhaps not so important, but uh, that gives again the, the sales of that plus the, the, the good, the phone. And if you think about buying rice on the market, uh, well, even there, there is some service, there is some vendor that sells that in the street. Uh, but you know, the content of that uh, simple item is more intense uh, in, uh, in, uh, in the food. And in general, you can, you can see in the data that uh, more good or food intensive goods are consumed uh, more by relatively poor people. But as you can become richer and you go to a sophisticated restaurant, much of the value added, more of the value added comes from the, from the uh, service industry. Okay, so how do we go about this measurement problem I mentioned? Well, suppose that we have the following information that you know, we can, uh, uh, to, some, uh, to, to a good extent, rely on. We know the expenditure share on the goods and also on the value added aggregates from which that, that, that comes. We have information on sectoral employment in each district and we know the consumption level that gives an idea about the, you know, some measure of earnings also at the, at the local level. Well, let me go first with uh, 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 the traditional way macroeconomists and growth uh, uh, theorists would go. They would assume somehow that preferences are homothetic, so that the expenditure shares on each good is independent of the level of income, something that we, look, we know well at the micro level is not true. So, but if we ignore that, so if we, if we in spite of uh, knowing it's not true, and many times we make assumptions that we know are not uh, very descriptive, we go and say, well, we, we measure the expenditure shares, and from that we can infer one-to-one, -one, if we know the appropriate parameters of the, you know, the utility function, we can retrieve the price. So imagine that we know the expenditure share, we don't know the price of the, of the consumer service that is provided, but if they are homothetic, well, just the knowledge of the consumer of the uh, expenditure share tells us about the price in a one-to-one -one way, because there is a one-to-one -one mapping from, from prices to expenditure share. So for instance, if we see that the expenditure share of consumer service has increased in daily between 1987 and 2011, well, that must mean that there has been a fall in price. The fall in price in turn, in turn is going to inform us about the productivity change. So if we have information about uh, some measure of earnings at the regional level and this price that has been inferred in the way I told you, then we can tell whether the there has been productivity growth in, the, uh, uh, in this service industry and how much. So that's very simple. In fact, it's too simple to be true because we know that preferences are not homothetic. So there are important income effects, and that's you know, what our paper wants to go uh, and, and study. When there are income effects, observing the share is not fully informative about the price, because part of the reason why the expenditure share changes may be due to the fact that the economy is becoming richer. Imagine that, for instance, there is progress in manufacturing industry, then if, they, if there is, if, if for instance, the services are a luxury, well, that implies that we will spend more on, uh, on services just uh, as a matter of an income effect. So to stay with the same observation where daily observe this, we observe this increase in this expenditure share on consumer service between 87 and 2011, just an example, of course. Well, if we recognize that there are uh, income effects, there is a shift of the curve that makes these falling prices, implicit uh, falling prices, be, be smaller, and it has also implication on the estimation of the productivity growth in service. Well, of course, how big this income effect is important? Because suppose that it's uh, even bigger than that, so that there's, there's a very strong income effect. Then we could even conclude 
that from this increase in the expenditure share is consistent with an increase in consumer uh, service prices rather than a decrease. Okay, so it becomes crucial to know that income elasticity. And the name of the game here is to model it in a way that is uh, uh, credible and consistent with the uh, micro evidence. That's what the paper is about, is to provide a credible way of measuring those income effects and from that to infer the prices from the expenditure shares and hence to go to the productivity, uh, to, to, to an estimate of productivity growth. But how do we measure these income elasticities in a, in a macro model? Well, in macro, we have some restriction because we, you know, we just measure uh, at the micro level, the estimation ends there and gives us some interesting uh, uh, observation. But if we want to keep it in a growth model, we, we cannot give up aggregation. So the class of preferences that are non monothetic and admit aggregation is actually quite limited. I would say two classes of preferences. The classical stone GA model, where there are some levels of subsistence, for instance, and then in, in the 70s, uh, John Wilbauer came up with uh, a class of preferences for price independent general linear system that have been uh, revamped recently by uh, researchers like Timo Boppert of Alde Boppert and Müller. They are three students of mine, so I, I want to make a, a, a very clear their, 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 their contribution here, their intellectual contribution. So with these type of preferences, we can still use macro model and have income effect. If we, in addition, want preferences that work well with the data, we have to soon to give up the stone GA, which will be the most tractable of all. In fact, we started the project from there, but somehow the, the, these income effects go away too quickly with growth. This, this pre those preferences don't work well. So let me spend a few minutes in describing these uh, bigger preferences and how they work. These bigger preferences have the feature that we cannot write a uh, a proper uh, um, analytical utility function, but we have to start from an indirect utility function and impose some property that that indirect utility function must satisfy. Rather than elaborate on that, let me tell you the implication of those preferences in terms of expenditure shares, which is the object that empirically we are going to use. Those preferences, in particular, you know, in, in that class, we, 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 we focus on a subset of those which are uh, known in the literature as pig law preferences that we not expand for why. They have these very intuitive features. Think about this theta n as the expenditure share on the final good n. It depends on the total expenditures on the income and on a vector of prices of all goods. Then this is equal to a constant, and if we stop there, we would be in the world of Cobb-Douglas preferences, plus a term that captures the non-motheticity, that is this kappa n, this is a parameter, and then this, this is a, what is inside the bracket here is a measure of, you know, of real income. I, I'm a little loose here, but that's what, what it is. So it's nominal expenditure divided by a composite uh, kind of price index. And then uh, this, the important thing is this elasticity. Essentially, what is uh, the feature of this uh, uh, um, of the angle curve? So the expenditure share here is that they increase if it's if uh, yes, they increase in the case of luxury and decrease in the case of necessity, and they converge to some long run level that could be anything. What you observe in a, in a very rich economy, for instance. So depending on the sign of that parameter, we can have we can. Uh, accommodate luxuries, necessities, everything. And we can estimate that elasticity epsilon. The assumption of this class of preferences is that that elasticity is the same for all goods, which is, of course, a very strong assumption. But, you know, we have made progress relative to the strong theory and even more so relative to homothetic preferences. And you can test whether that's a good approximation of the reality. An important feature of this class of preferences is that we can actually go from the expenditure shares on individual goods to the expenditure share on value-added aggregate. So we look at the component of value-added in all the goods in the economy, and we can still have representation of the expenditure share function as an isoelastic uh, 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 you know, function that declines to some, or increases to some long-run levels. For instance, 
what we estimate is that food is a necessity, it means that uh, at the early stage of development, a country is poor, or when people are poor, they spend a large part of the budget on food. In contrast, they spend a smaller part of their budget on uh, uh, services. So services are luxury, and you know, and and this is this is the type of uh, relationship that we are going to estimate from the data. Another feature, and you know, this uh, is my last. Uh, uh, I will have another one. So this is the most technical part of the talk. Then I'll uh, become more uh, relaxed uh, with uh, with math very soon. So. Another feature that I want to emphasize is that we can go from the individual expenditure share to aggregate, like district level expenditure share. Uh, and you know, somehow these preferences allow me to do uh, the appropriate aggregation. So we can somehow move between individual preferences and aggregate preferences. What remains constant is this elasticity parameter uh, epsilon. That, that is the strength of the income effect from which I have started. So whether that epsilon is estimated to be large or small, whether we converge fast or, or slow towards the long-term expenditure tells me informs you about the importance of income effects. Okay, so this is the structure of preferences. Once we have the structure of preferences, the way we go is we write a set of equilibrium condition that uh, essentially describes uh, market clearing uh, uh, condition for uh, consumer services. So in each Indian district, we have a condition that says that whatever is produced in terms of consumer services must be consumed local. And then we have a demand function for those services. And similarly for the tradable goods, except of course the tradable goods are uh, 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 traded and so the market are nationwide and we want to consider some uh, uh, cost of uh, uh, trading those goods. So those costs uh, 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 depend on the distance between different districts and we use uh, uh, some existing data and existing studies about elasticity to infer those trade costs. So in that sense, this is a, a so this part is like a, a standard trade model, the one on tradable goods, but on the top of that, we have uh, uh, R markets, uh, one for each district uh, for uh, uh, the clearing of the consumer services. And then we have labor markets that clear. Now, as I said, in the, in the basic model, we assume that uh, uh, people don't move across districts, but in an extension, we also allow people to, to choose where to live according to some preference parameter and some relative uh, elasticity that determine the, the migration, which is, of course, something we can match to the data. Okay, so, in this system that might look uh, a bit complicated uh, at this stage, uh, it's actually conceptually very simple because what we know is, so we have information from the data about employment, about average earnings that we proxy from the microdata from the uh, national sample survey in each district on uh, uh, consumption, which is what we use. And then essentially, that's, those are the data input that we use. Then we have a set of parameters that we must estimate either internally or uh, externally to the model. As you see, there are quite a few, and some of them are actually quite uncontroversial, and some of them are pinned down by restriction. I'm going to focus my discussion in the time that is left to me on the parameter epsilon, that is the income elasticity I told you. So once I have those parameters and those data, I can retrieve what you see here in the uh, uh, green uh, uh, square, the set of productivity parameters for a particular year, let's say 1987, for all sector and all districts. So for all districts, I will be able to tell you uh, the level of productivity in the, in the three main industries, food, uh, you know, agriculture, if you want, industry, and consumer services. And so I will have an entire map of India with all those productivity, and I can redo the estimate for uh, 2011, and I see how that changes. We don't need to use any published price index to do this exercise. Although you see prices there, those prices have an analytical expression that comes internal to the model. So in some way, we can also verify exposed 
how those priors behave relatively to those produced by the national statistics of India. And they are not, they are not too different, actually, uh, at least for the trade goods. So once we know that, what can we do? Well, we have a map of productivities of India in 1987, another map of productivities in 2011, and we can make full experiment of the following type. Imagine there was no, there had been no growth in consumer service sector in India or in some districts. How much would consumers suffer that lack of growth? How much they value the growth that comes from different parts of the economy? And the answer I think will be interesting because it will be not only you know, an amount of taste for growth, but it also will vary across the spectrum on the population. Okay, so let me let me skip this for, for the sake of time. Just a quick uh, 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 highlight of uh, uh, you know a quick a quick comment on, on the data. Uh, so we use data from different uh, set of uh, uh, you know statistical sources uh, from India. The National Sample Service, of course, uh, you know it's a, it's a well-known uh, uh, data set, and we uh, use it as our main source of information. We rely mostly on the employment and employment schedule. We also use the survey on household expenditure. We also need to distinguish within the service sector what is services that are provided to consumer and what is services that are provided to firms. And then we, we use additional information that comes from the economic census and from the survey of service, uh, service firm. So I'll be happy to say more uh, if I must. Now, for the sake of time, I have to be a little quick on that. So the main parameter that I want to discuss is this income elasticity. So this income elasticity can actually be estimated by looking at individual levels. So we look at the expenditure of each household in the Indian economy, and we run a regression that follows exactly the functional form that is prescribed by our preferences we control for district fixed effect because prices may actually be different in different districts. And so we look how, much, how the expenditure share on different goods vary with uh, the uh, uh, income level of each household. In principle, to estimate epsilon, we could do on any good because the theory asks that epsilon be the same. Well, of course, it may be the theory is wrong. Well, we do a lot of work to convince ourselves that although, you know, if you push me hard enough with uh, uh, fine categories, I will not be able to show you that they are always, uh, uh, you know, insignificantly different one from another, but by and large, and across several specifications, that income elasticity is very well estimated. In fact, we start from using data on food because we think that this is well measured, and, you know, we use a variety of strategy, we use uh, uh, individual food items, or we aggregate all the expenditure on food. We use uh, some instrumental variable uh, where we predict the expenditure by using occupation as opposed to just using the, the observed one that may have measurement error. There is actually very little uh, change. If we use the expenditure share on service categories, which we also have, and we were initially a little less uh, confident uh, from a data point of view, but the results continue to be quite similar. So this, this elasticity, this critical parameter I told you at the beginning, seem to be relatively uh, pretty well estimated in the data. In fact, I've gone to China, I don't have this uh, level of segregation yet, and we find very similar results. Okay, now it's time to uh, spend the remaining time on the findings. Finding number one is that we, I can tell you in a particular year, in 1987 or in 2011, I, I used two different years, let's focus on 2011, how much heterogeneity I have in the productivity uh, of consumer services across space. There is a substantial degree of heterogeneity and the richer the uh, um, districts, the higher the productivity. Now you could think, well, but that's, it's because People are richer there, precisely the reason why they, they consume more uh, consumer services. And the, and the answer is no, because I have already control for that. So I have already taken away the effect that comes from the fact that in more urban districts, because they are richer, there is a higher demand for those goods. So everything that comes, uh, uh, that, that you know, the data shows some heterogeneity that is 
larger than what is predicted by the income effect, which are precisely estimated. And so I have this, uh, this type of picture. So maybe it's not too surprising. This is the second finding that we find, even, you know, I find especially interesting. If I measure the productivity growth in the three sectors in India using my structural methodology, it turns out that the highest productivity growth rate comes from the consumer service sector, even more than from the manufacturing industry. Again, this is after taking away the, the, the income effect. So in principle, if you believe my model, that's, that's a really genuine productivity growth, averaging, of course, across different localities. This is a nationwide average. So is this a completely insane idea? Well, let me tell you the following. We don't have, of course, a, a, a counterpart in the statistical uh, data. But there are measures of value-added growth at the uh, you know, service industry group level. And actually, I, I was surprised to see that uh, you know, our estimate is not very far from those. If anything, we disagree a bit more on the growth rate of productivity in the manufacturing sector that uh, we think is lower than using the official data. I mean, the official data, I told you at the beginning why I don't want to rely much on those. But still, it's interesting to see that it's not that our methodology delivers something that is, you know, it delivers something that is different, but not totally different from what you have if you uh, use the standard price indices. Okay, what do we do once we know that there's been so much productivity growth? I said we go to the quantification of this welfare effect. Our methodology, and this is somehow new because we have these normalized preferences allows us to ask a hypothetical question to every Indian household. We can ask the following question. By what percentage should we change the income, in your income in 2011 to make you different between living in that district in 2011 or going to a situation hypothetical in which consumer service productivity growth has been zero between 1987 and 2011? And it may be in a simpler term, how much do you value productivity growth in different sectors? Now, this answer is going to be different depending on where people live and, and on their income. Where people, where people live is important because in some places productivity growth has been, has been higher than others. So if you live in a place like uh, Bangalore, then you have had a very high productivity growth relative to a, a small rural district. The second thing is, rich people consume more services than and less uh, goods so those people are going to be especially uh, you know the beneficiary of this uh, service that growth on the contrary when we look at productivity growth in agriculture it's a bit of the opposite view they those who care the most will be poor people the question is by how much okay so let me start with this picture that focuses on two uh, district out of the 400 that we we have. Well, one is a is a is a poor uh, uh, rural district, uh, uh, Bankura in West Bengal, uh, and the other is uh, Bangalore. So what you see here, it's, it's, it says welfare loss, but the way you have to interpret is how much you would be, how much you value the growth that comes from productivity uh, growth in service sector. So. In, uh, in Bangalore, the richest people in Bangalore would say it's, if, if it's worth 25% of my 2011 income. The richest people, sorry, in, in, in Bankura, I can I mean, in Bankura, 25%. In Bangalore, 75%. Why? Well, first of all, because there has been much more productivity growth in the service sector in Bangalore than in Bankura. Second, and this is like the, the difference between poor and rich. Now, if you look at the horizontal axis here, you see people with different level of income. Uh, the, the, the unit of measure is, is, is arbitrary. So don't, don't just think in relative terms. Don't look at those numbers. They don't, they don't mean any particular, anything particular in the, the horizontal axis. But on the right is richer people. On the left is poorer people. So you see, the, the poor people in uh, Bankura essentially don't care at all about the welfare effect of the, about the growth of productivity in the consumer services. Instead, in Bangalore, even the poor people care about 50% uh, of their 2011 income, 
And then there is this large difference between Bangkok and Bangalore that, is, that reflects the fact that uh, the growth rate of local consumer services was, was different. Now, from this, we can try to produce something that is a bit more general, looks at the income distribution on a more on a, on a broader dimension. So we, instead of looking just at two districts, we could do this for all Indian districts, of course. Then, oh, I should say that you know, of course, that the need the median income in Bankura is also much smaller than in Bangalore. So part of the fact why people care more in Bangalore is also there are very uh, many more uh, rich households, richer households in Bangalore than in Bankura. That's, that's the, the dashed uh, line you see as well. So I can uh, ask the same question and look at uh, a different uh, percentile of the income distribution uh, here. To, the way to interpret this, this figure, uh, so here I'm still looking at the value of uh, uh, productivity growth in consumer services for households with different uh, uh, income, a different percentile of the income distribution. So the 10% are the 10% poorer people in India averaging across location, and 99% are the, is the 1% richest people. Now you see that the, the value of productivity growth in services is much higher for these people, for the, for the uh, consumer service, uh, for, for, the, for the richest people, it, it, it is much higher than for the poorer people. And if we look at urbanization quintiles, similar picture, people living in the uh, top 20% uh, 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 urbanized district uh, have a much bigger concern for the welfare associated with uh, the, the, the productivity, uh, with, with the consumer sales productivity growth than the rest of the population. So th this picture shows that the gains of this type of service life growth are very skewed in favor of cities and in favor of rich people. What about if we do the same with agriculture? So how much do you value the productivity growth that we estimate in agriculture? And you see that it's the opposite somehow. So the poorest people, and the people living in the most uh, uh, rural places uh, are actually those who benefit the most from the productivity growth we have in agriculture, and it's of the order of 25%. For those people, it's more important than the productivity growth we have had in the service industries. For manufacturing, it's in between. Again, for manufacturing goods, it's more important for the rich than for the poor, because you know, industrial goods are also a luxury, according to our estimate, although less of a luxury than consumer services, whereas agricultural goods are strong necessities. That's the idea. In fact, if we now do the exercise of average out across the whole population, we find, so this is somehow contains the same information that you see here, but averaging out and just taking some, some measure that you know, averages uh, according to the district where people live and weighting the size of the district and uh, the size of, a, size of each percentile of income distribution. And you see that consumer services on average uh, have had the most important role on welfare growth in India. Of course, this hides all the heterogeneity that I told you about in the previous, in the previous uh, uh, graph. We also find that uh, structural change in India. So one question could be more positive rather than normative. How much of the transformation of the economy has been driven by productivity growth in services? Well, according to our model and to our estimate, consumer productivity growth in consumer services has been more important than productivity growth in agriculture in determining structural change. So the reason why we see uh, so much uh, you know, more urbanization and the growth of the consumer service itself is much more driven by the productivity growth of the, of the services than, than that in the production of goods. The way to interpret this graph, the red bars represent the actual change. So you see there has been like a minus a full in deployment and agriculture of 18 percentage point. And the second tells you, well, if there had been no consumer service productivity growth, well, that, that decline in agriculture would be lower than, than 10 percentage point. So this is somehow uh, you know, surprising because I guess the, the, the uh, presumption is that uh, uh, productivity growth in agriculture is the main driver of structural transformation. 
again, under the assumption of our model, it seems that productivity growth in services is the most important driver of uh, uh, productivity change. Okay, so we do a number of uh, robustness check, and I, I don't, I'm not going to uh, uh, tell you the detail of those, but uh, just the, you know. Yeah, can I show you a little yellow card to you? <laughs> can we? <he? laughs> yeah, so can we uh, do it in 10 minutes now or? No. Uh, I, 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 I will not need 10 minutes. I will probably yeah. need five minutes, actually. Sure, sure. Okay. Yeah. Okay, but we are doing well. So. Yeah. Thank you. Right, so I just want to tell you the type of, uh, so the analysis here was done as if uh, uh, India was a, a closed economy, for instance, which is of course you know, a very strong assumption because in this period, India became uh, more open and part of the export uh, is actually coming from the service sector. So we, we, we now generalize the model and we embed it in an open economy model. We look at uh, the role of ICT export we study the role of labor mobility. We are aware that there are many potentially treacherous choices about how to measure the service industries. So maybe we are exaggerating the role of consumer service at expense of producer services. We have done all those sorts of exercises. It turns out that, you know, here I have uh, a table, and again, I'm not planning to. Uh, take you through all the numbers, but the, the bottom line is that although many of these assumptions may be strong, once you relax them, the effect on the, on the, uh, you know, on the picture I gave you is pretty much, uh, uh, is, is rather small. So we continue to see this uh, important role of uh, um, uh, consumer services and also these uh, uh, skewed gains, okay? In fact, I'm, uh, yes, I was saying, I, I don't need the, the, the whole 10 minutes. I, I just want to wrap up though, uh, on what we have done because I understand it was a little fast. So the, the, the big question is, we see this uh, service uh, uh, boom in India and there is an underlying concern that uh, some people have expressed that that's, uh, you know, that cannot sustain itself in the long run because what we have seen in other economies uh, was so different. So, of course, we cannot answer the question of where the growth of service, productivity growth in services comes from, and I will say something in a moment about that. But still, the fact that there was a high productivity growth in that sector uh, feels reassuring with respect to another picture in which that is just uh, a pure consequence of the growth process. So it looks as if productivity growth in service sector can be substantial and has been substantial in India during this period. The exercise we do is an accounting exercise. If I go back to the, uh, you know, to uh, what is it, 25 years ago, there was a debate about the growth in the uh, East Asian uh, uh, economies, uh, whether that was going to be sustainable over time or it was mostly just pure capital accumulation. And there was a dispute between two economists, uh, uh, Alvin Yang and Chiang Kai-shek. So Alvin Yang uh, concluded that uh, uh, the main driver was capital and human capital accumulation. And so that was going to, uh, you know, had already reached somehow its, uh, its, uh, its most important uh, effects. And Chiang Kai-shek came up and showed that no, contrary to the conclusion of uh, Alvin, there was a, a large role of productivity growth uh, in manufacturing in those economies. So that led to somehow more optimism about uh, the perspective of those economies. And I would say that th those, uh, that optimism has actually been uh, vindicated by the evidence in the, in the last 25 years. You know, Korea has continued to grow fast, uh, uh, so as uh, Singapore, and then China, of course, uh, was not actually in the sun, but, uh, has done so. So the fact that we see this high productivity growth in, in, the, in the industry that has become so large is at least indicative of some, uh, you know, it's a source of optimism. On the other hand, we uncover some uh, new facts that, to the best of my knowledge, uh, have not been prominent in the discussion. The fact that if 
uh, productivity growth is uh, certainly flat, there is a bias in this growth uh, in favor of rich people living in urban uh, uh, places. It does, I'm not saying this is a, you know, good or bad. I'm saying this uh, is a natural, natural implication of two assumptions. The first is that these type of services are provided locally, and I would be willing to defend the fact that this is by and large an assumption. And the second is that preferences are, are actually uh, non authentic so, on the one hand, service have grown not necessarily such a bad omen, but it raises somehow a new thought about uh, the distributive effect of this. It's not only about India, because if you think of the US economy, there is a sense in which a large part of the country feels it's left, it has been left behind by the successful growth in the East Coast, and although at least you know, for some time, actually now other areas are, are doing better. But somehow this in regional inequality may actually be uh, important. I also want to say that we are working uh, on uh, applying the same methodology to China. And although we don't, we, we haven't done this at the disaggregated level the way I've done it with India, uh, we have done it on aggregate for China. And the interesting fact is that the decline of the manufacturing sector and the growing role of services is also a feature of China. And also in China, during the last 10 years, not over the entire period, productivity growth has been higher in services and manufacturing. So it looks as if, you know, this tertiarization, as we call it, so, you know, becoming more service-oriented is, is also a feature, you know, at least an incipient feature of an economy like China, which is very much like an industrial power. So what are we doing in, uh, in our uh, next research? Well, the first, we would like to have a theory of the determinants of productivity growth in consumer services. We're not necessarily thinking that this is all innovation, or back to my work, uh, some of my work with Philippe Leon, who was mentioned initially. It could be that, uh, you know, it's rationalization, marketization, it's the role of digitalization in the economy that has been very prominent also in the, in the action of the government. Uh, we have to figure out, you know, in a, in a kind of, uh, you know, informed way of how to estimate those, those things. Um, we would like to know more about whether these patterns are representative. You know, the, the, the aggregate pattern, I told you, it's common to other countries, but uh, the, the, the detail is uh, uh, in the developing world that's uh, maybe different. And, you know, we're studying currently the pattern of gender inequality during the structural transformation and also the implication of, uh, for uh, environmental sustainability. Mm -hmm. If we move to a world where production uh, of goods is less uh, important than production of services is more important, that may Thank have an implication on environmental sustainability. Thank you. Hey, great presentation. Thank you. Uh, um, I think I, ha I see uh, one question coming from one Mr. Panda. Uh, can Panda just say it out? Say it out. Say it out. No. Hello. Yeah, Mr. Panda, go ahead. Yeah. No, thank you for a very exciting lecture. My question is on the policy front. If the service-led growth is more unequal, what could be done to, right. for redistribution from the point of production to the point of consumption without affecting the productivity? Yes, I mean, it's a, it's a very important question and also a, a delicate one. So, uh, in many ways, so if you just look at the aggregate part, uh, I would reject a view of the world by which governments uh, uh, must go behind the industrial sector and support its growth, uh, rather than let the economy becoming more service-oriented. And I, I would say, I would, I would actually argue that even more forcefully in, in the US than, uh, than in the case of India, where there may be arguably some, some reason to, to favor in some respect industrialization. But the, I guess that uh, being aware that uh, some regions are left behind, even more than it can appear from the data, uh, can lead to uh, you know, the, the necessity of doing more uh, type of regional redistribution. And again, 
being aware of the fact that uh, that may go against uh, uh, the forces that bring uh, structural transformation. I mean, the part of the message here is that although agriculture may uh, somehow have been less important than consumer services on aggregate, its success and its support of the activity in that part of the economy may be important for uh, redistributive reasons. So I'm afraid that I'm highlighting here trade-offs and, and somehow the taste uh, of the policymakers will have to say in which direction uh, one wants to press. Okay, so we have uh, Suresh Babu. Uh, can you go ahead? Uh, thank you very much for the presentation. Uh, a small clarification. Uh, how does the model actually take into account uh, possible productivity spillovers across sectors as well as regions? I can see that in your Econometrica paper that there is uh, some mention about labor mobility and uh, the kind of cons consumer sectors that we are talking about, service sectors that we are talking about. There is a possibility that productivity is also uh, intimately tied to labor. And once when labor is mobile, you know, you could have regional variations in productivity. So does the model address this and how does it really take care of this? That's a great question. This is an accounting framework. So the short answer will be that we were silent about that. So it could be in the limits that all the source of productivity growth comes from the industrial sector and everything else is spillover. I'm just telling you what is the exposed productivity growth. And at this stage, uh, we're silent. I mean, we need somehow a growth model, which is what I've done uh, the rest of my life for now. And this is almost like a growth accounting framework. So whether it's through labor mobility, whether it's through proximity to industrial center, whether there are spillovers from different across different service industries, remains uh, an open question. And I, I can tell you that adding in the current framework uh, migration doesn't do much, but you hint at something that could be important, that when people move, they bring with them some, uh, you know, ability to produce new ideas, some, something that actually uh, transforms the economy in other part of the, of the country. And I, I'm not uh, able at this point to tell you how important that, that is. So here, when I do the exercise with uh, labor mobility, I am just uh, you know, taking this productivity growth for what they are, and I let people go after opportunities. But it could well be that these opportunities are created by the mobility of people. And in fact, it, it pushed me. I think that that's uh, probably uh, true. Uh, I guess that uh, the next step of this research will have to answer this question. Uh, may I go over to uh, Dinesh Awasti, please? He's talking about interregional differences. Please, Dinesh. Uh, Dinesh, are you there? This is Amita, this is not me. Sorry? I think the question that we wanted to raise has already been kind of taken care of. But the only point I would still uh, like to uh, emphasize. We are, we are unable to hear properly, please. Yeah, the questions that we wanted to raise has already been taken care of by okay. the speakers. But the, only one point that I would still like to emphasize is uh, I think we need to still bring the issue of the, uh, I mean, the, the labor, uh, labor, I mean, the workers uh, part of it. It doesn't really mean much if you say that it, it gives higher employment and lower employment, but for which, where and what, who are the losers of that and who are the gainers of that. And this we Take it towards that point. I think that this is not, probably not the. I think we have missed out the whole issue. Yeah, is the you? This is a comment. I think you are making right. Like it's a comment, right? Not a question. Yeah, because my question has already been uh, 
yeah. Okay, uh, we go to Jitu Tamuli. Uh, <coughs> Hello, sir. I am audible. Yes. Uh, I would like to know uh, how can we uh, make the service led, uh, service led growth of Indian uh, economy growth story pro people and uh, how can we make it you know, accumulate the benefits of growth to the rural corner of India because the, you know the future of India lies in the rural sector and uh, the transformation of labor, I mean, the migration of labor from the rural areas to the urban areas also had affected uh, the you know, productivity growth of labor uh, or the skilled labor in rural areas itself, which is a big challenge in Indian economy today. So uh, how can it be addressed, you know, uh, when it is examined by the professors in a very uh, analytical and very clear way, so what his prescription for uh, prescription policy prescription to come out of this. Yes, thank you. So, if I understand well the question, there is a what's the role of the change in the quality of the labor force somehow, and and I I think we um, there's two things here. The first is uh, we take into account, although I didn't emphasize the change in uh, educational attainment in our estimates, it plays some role during this period, but not not uh, not huge role. In terms of the structural transformation, uh, we do this uh, more carefully in one extension in which, so let me say how we do it in the basic model and how we go about it in the extension. So in the basic model, we assume that people have in different districts have different uh, productivity. So there are different people have a, a different number of uh, uh, efficiency units of labor that they supply in the market. And they can be hired by any of the sectors. So there is no reason a priori why uh, the more productive people should be allocated to certain industries and uh, rather than to some others. Now, empirically, of course, we see that uh, the uh, educational content, uh, people working uh, in services and in manufacturing is, uh, for instance, higher than in agriculture. And we understand that that uh, could partly have some technological reasons. So uh, we construct a model where this is actually part of the story. So the fact that the educational uh, um, attainment uh, improves in the population is itself a source uh, of the structural transformation. And indeed, that is true. And we also study the extent to which uh, uh, technological progress uh, that we can estimate through that function is a uh, skill bias. And once again, what we learn from there is that skill bias, that technological progress is more skill bias in urban uh, uh, places than in rural places. And indeed, the fact that there is more uh, uh, higher attainment labor force is, uh, is, uh, has some role in promoting the urbanization altogether. Uh, that said, these results do not disturb the, the finding that the productivity growth uh, in the service sector remains uh, the main, uh, the main uh, uh, source of growth. Once again, it could be that the fact that these people acquire education is at the root of the observation that we have so much productivity growth in services. And that's, you know, the limitation of this accounting framework. It just tells you there is higher productivity, but uh, this is related to a question that was made before. It could be that precisely because more educated people go there that we have higher productivity. And I would say, again, this requires uh, another step of the, of the process, but still, you know, we may, we may be more or less satisfied of just knowing this. Remember that underlying this discussion, there is a view of the world by which the service sector is not capable of producing any technological improvement. So if that was the case, we would not even have to ask uh, the, the question because that would, be, would mean that the only productivity growth can come through the manufacturing sector. And most of the studies that uh, I continue to see, and most of the studies that I have done, 
have used only data on the manufacturing industries. So I would defend the fact that knowing that the service sector is so dynamic is already important in guiding future research and also in making at least suggested policy implications of the type. Don't think that because the economy is becoming more service oriented, don't think that this is a sign that the economic growth is going to go down in the next five years. I know if I go to the Chinese economy these days, I and instead I tell them you have to worry because you've pushed so much on the development of infrastructure these days, but the marginal product of those is very low these days. So what's coming next? Either you manage to have a, a you know a high productivity growth in some sectors of the economy, or the decline of productivity growth is going to continue. Well, in the case of India, but this study ends in 2011, so I have to be careful, but I, at least there is no sign of it. Uh, we have maybe two more questions. Uh, Rahul Chavan has two interesting questions. Rahul, please go ahead. Is so, Rahul, yeah. Am I audible to you, sir? Yes. Yes, sir. Thank you so much for the interesting session, and it was really a nice discussion. I just had two queries, sir. Uh, one was regarding the period of the selection of the study, because if you see the you know the the data, uh, especially after 2014, we are talking about the structural changes, right? So that is you know the after 2014, there are a lot of structural changes are happening in India. Uh, I just had this query about this another you know, period that I just want to know that what was the rationale behind selecting this period of 24 years from 1987 to 2011. So that was one question, and another was like, what are uh, half of the half of the answer I got it, but uh, still I just want to ask, what are the policy implications of this study in the Indian context? If you see the consumer services, yeah. So I uh, I have a good answer to why I cannot go further back because essentially. Uh, the NSS uh, editions before 1987 don't have enough level of, uh, you know, the quality of disaggregated information that I can get is too limited. And I have less of a, in fact, actually, we are working on more recent data now. And I, I guess historically, we got access to, to and, and we, we, we start analyzing this data. And, uh, I don't have a particularly good answer why we haven't extended further down. It has to be done, of course. I can say that uh, when I look at the data after, uh, so you saw one of the graph was actually from uh, CLAMS data, uh, the one across countries. And again, adding the years later does not uh, uh, change the picture in a uh, very drastic way. So uh, again, it could be that some of the answers will be different. Actually, we are, we are working these days more on uh, the dimension of, uh, uh, you know, time use at, the, at this point uh, on more recent data, but, uh, you know, we haven't done it. And I think, you know, we, I, hope, uh, I hope we will do or some other people will, will extend. The other, the other question on policy implication. Yes, Again, I, I have, uh, you know, and I, I, I have received a couple of questions before uh, on this point. Um, I think it's interesting from the policy point of view to, to, to uh, observe and you know, to find that this, the, the service sector is potentially a source of dynamic gains. Yes, so it would be very different again if, you know, the, the wisdom that we are sort of trying to counter is one that says, well, uh, we observe India growing, but it will never be like China because the path of development is so different. And somehow, again, more work would be needed perhaps to, to support this view, but it suggests to me that that's not the case. And it's important for India, it's also important for uh, African economies, because African economies, like, it's even more extreme. So in some of them, India has a relatively slow growth of the manufacturing sector, but uh, if I go to countries like Ethiopia or Tanzania, uh, there is high, high growth, and, you know, the one argument is, well, it's just uh, the price of uh, 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 raw materials that has been favorable for some years, 
and then they, they, they have some surplus, they are consuming it, but nothing else is happening. So I think that that's, that's the way in which I would, uh, uh, I would think of pitching this, uh, uh, these results. And, you know, I, I also know that there has been a lot of uh, investment in India, that's something that, you know, we haven't studied at this point, but in the process of digitalization, for instance. So how so much productivity growth can be promoted not by traditional industrial policy that makes grow uh, the economy through manufacturing sectors, but by you know making people access to you know for instance to a bank account can come from, and you know this approach we we use here uh, suggests to value uh, uh, services not by some you know intrinsic characteristics, but by how much people are willing to pay for them. So if people are willing to pay more for services, there is intrinsic value in, the, in that. And again, my, my sense is that it would provide a ground for developing uh, policies in this direction. It's something, again, I'm, I'm more of a China scholar, although I, I hope to become more of an Indian scholar later. Uh, but I, I, I have this uh, same type of message for, for that country. Uh, all the debate seems to be on industrial policy. Maybe the debate has to move also more in the direction of, uh, you know, service digitalization and this part of the economy. Okay, sir. thank you, sir. Thank you so much. Okay, okay. so I think uh, that kind of uh, concludes the number of questions we have. Maybe I'll just conclude. Um, so great presentation. Thank you very much. I think two issues. Over the last so many decades, you know, India's agriculture share has come down, and of course, the service sector share has substantially grown up. And we were worried about that. We wanted to have more manufacturing uh, share. But added to that, what this study is bringing out is even if you have high growth, it's the urban consumer service sector that's uh, growing faster. So, you know, for, for a larger share in the economy, growth rate also has been very large. I think. We need to monitor this uh, for sure. Uh, maybe perhaps as um, one of the participants, Rahul Chavan said, uh, you have looked up to only 2011. And I think after 2014 onward, there have been substantial changes in the infrastructure or digital transformation. And that digital transformation has been quite inclusive uh, digital transformation. You know, and therefore ports, dams, or PLI scheme, production link incentive scheme, so to, I'll also agree that there is substantial change in the infrastructure uh, and uh, uh, manufacturing facilitation. So it will be interesting to see what happens, you know, post 11 and up to 2022 20, or 23. I think if we get some different result, that's some endorsement for the current policies than up to 2011 policies. So that can be probably tried. But thanks, thank you very much for, uh, you know, for a wonderful uh, eclectic seminar. Uh, thanks for all attendees to come also for visiting us. Uh, let me hand over to uh, Professor Charan Singh, uh, back to him. Uh, Professor Charan Singh. Yes. Yeah. Fabrizio, I must mention this is an excellent work and you have really triggered so many thoughts in minds of all of us. As Professor Deodhar mentioned, the period that you have taken, and if you had gone a little beyond, there has been a stru structural transformation in the Indian economy. I don't know how many studies have been done in India. How did we miss the historical trend of agriculture moving to manufacturing and then the services, and we moved directly from agriculture to services? That riddle and that puzzle has yet to be conclusively solved. Your study now fits in and provides a potential answer to that riddle. The services are highly productive, especially the urban, because urbanization was taking place in a big way during the space. We went in for a very substantial, revolutionary, I would say, economic liberalization starting in 1991. And that had a substantial impact on the structural transformation of the economy. We had to catch up with China, and I told you in the beginning, we, we are in a sort of a rat race with China. And then probably China became the world's manufacturing hub and the industry, and we were trying now, or the Indian private sector was now trying to pitch in 
and become the global services hub. And of course, in the story that we are narrating to you, there is the IT revolution that took place in Bangalore, Hyderabad, and Chennai, starting sometimes around 93, 94, and was at its peak in much later years. As Professor Deodar mentioned, the digitalization of the Indian economy is still ongoing. And the services sector in terms of banking and insurance and the transformation which we have brought in through the jam trinity, which we call the cell phones and the mobile phones and the technology that we have brought in is amazing. Now, this, this research of yours fits in in that literature. And we really are thankful to you for undertaking this research. And I'm sure uh, with illustrious people on our um, uh, participating today and listening to you, it's going to trigger lots of research here as well as abroad. I'm sure about it. So I want to thank you uh, for this. As you know, in all partial equilibrium analysis, we really can't take the whole thing into account. We do take birds eye views and take snippets and I think that is where your study is extremely informative and I think very, very useful for us in policy making. And I also think that it, it, this leads us on a path to answer that riddle. And why we took a quantum leap indirectly from agriculture to services without going through the path of industry, which many of us felt, have we done a mistake? Is there an error? What is it? But research studies like you show that the Indians are smart and they take advantage and therefore they benefit from this uh, leapfrogging. So the recording of this excellent presentation will be available on our website tomorrow and we will share the link with you and I'm sure many of us are going to take advantage uh, of your presentation as well as the econometric technique that you have used. And I think there's lots of learning up there also for us. There's an important announcement. As you know, we have done the G20 Task Force 5. And we had a series of seven webinars uh, looking at the international economic order. The EGRO Foundation is now delving into something uh, which is very interesting. Uh, trying to understand why the female labor force participation in our country is so low. It is also one of the agenda items under G20. We have done one webinar last week. We are going to do about 10 of them in the month of July, August, and September. It is in that series of um, looking at female labor force participation or say that uh, female labor force participation empowering women for a developed India in 2047. Our next Friday talk is, it is on gender mainstreaming at India's land ports. So it's um, something to do with, again, female labor force participation. And the presentation will be done by uh, Ms. Sanjana Joshi, uh, who's a senior fellow at ICRIAR. So I would invite you all, the timing will be a little different. We'll be doing it from four to five. Um, uh, she is in India, unlike Professor Fabrizio, who was away, and then we are doing this little late, uh, little late um, seminar. So it will be four to five next week. So I would invite all of you to please come and participate in that, where Sanjana shows that there is discrimination at the land ports. And as you know, India has a long, very long uh, border. And so they have studied at different border points and seen how women participation is getting impacted. So I'd invite all of you to please come uh, and participate in that also. So once again, let me thank Professor Fabrizio. Let me thank Professor Deodar for chairing the session and navigating us through a very complex um, presentation, but made it very simplified by Professor himself. And then the participation from the uh, participants also was very good. So thanks to all of you. Have a great weekend and see you next Friday.
Thank you. Thank you very much for the invitation again. Thank you.